of 175 passengers from 36 countries, 123 perished, including the hijackers. Of Dad, there was still no news, only an ominous silence. I went to Wilson Airport, Nairobi, with my friend Duncan Willits. We chartered an aircraft to fly us to Moroni, the capital of the Comoros, where a makeshift morgue had been set up. So we drove to this meat factory, it was right, right near the ocean. And we went inside and there was pro probably 80 to 100 bodies lying on the floor in, in, in rows. And they were covered by sheets. And we had to basically go through each one to find Brian and Dad. Uh, Brian Tetley was on the flight as well. Um, we had to go through each one to find them. So Duncan started at one end and I started at the other end. And I, f I found Dad's body. And I, I, I really didn't know what to, what to, I found his body and I, I put the sheet back on and I walked outside. And I brace, basically broke down. What were your thoughts on that flight? We never actually talked about this when we were there. We didn't really say much on the trip there. Did you think he would have made it when we were flying over, or were you pretty convinced that he had Well, I, w I must admit, I was pretty convinced that he died. Mm. You know, we were, tr we were trying to you know, tell you, he'll be all right, he'll be all right. He'll be having a couple of drinks mm. there, he'll live it. But I, I, I knew he had because there's no noise from him. Mm. You know, had he survived, we would have heard. That was his job, to tell the world about it, you know, to report on it. And sadly, th th this was it, I had a foreboding that they'd both gone. What did you feel? You were close to the both of them, yeah. very close to the both of them. What did you feel oh, at that time? Devastated, absolutely devastated. That they'd gone in such a ridiculous manner. A completely nonsensical, useless, waste of time manner. Where it, it, the thing that should never, never have happened. Mm. I mean, car accidents happen, you know, they could have both died in a car accident, we all know that. But the fact that, that some people survived and some people didn't. Two thirds died, and that's what they say is the average for a crash in the sea. Mm. And unfortunately, our two were. Brian was in uh, economy, uh, business, and business, yeah. and everybody. In business died. died. Yeah. Your father didn't survive, but the guy next to him survived. Mm. Now, whether he didn't have his seatbelt fastened, which is typical Mohammed, mm. well, you know, I, you know, mm. don't need that. And he shot up. A lot of them got killed because yeah. he cracked their head on the on the on the luggage thing. Looking back, had he wished for a way to go, had he been able to choose a way to go, I think this would have been one of those, not necessarily the hijack or a botched hijacking, but the fact that it was the biggest story of the day. He wasn't even covering it. Um, it was the biggest story of the day. It has put him down in that it, it, it kept his status to legendary because of the way he died. Had he just been you know, an old man that passed away in his sleep. The drama wouldn't have been there. The drama of his life wouldn't have been there. And he had that drama right to the very end. And, you know, I think that in some way that gives you some consolation for whatever it's worth. He was brought up in a very, you know, poor working class environment. He didn't have the benefit of a good education. He had no formal training in television or stills photography, yet he achieved what possibly no other cameraman in history had ever achieved. And his life philosophy, his life philosophy was that if I can do it, anybody else can. We are in the most powerful profession in the world. The stories that we do reach millions of people. We can make a difference, and if we use that power responsibly, it can change the world, and it can change Africa, which desperately, desperately needs it. For much of his life, Dad had to work with correspondents sent from the West. How he yearned for a time when Africa would stand on its own feet. The Mohammed Amin Foundation was one of his dreams that was never fulfilled. Um, maybe just tell us your name for the camera and what you do. He wanted to set up a training school for African journalists. He wanted to prove to the world that there were many other Muhammad Amins on this continent, many other journalists that could do as well as he did, and we didn't need the foreign correspondents to come here and tell our story. 
then we came here to cut out five. And that, I feel, is personally one of my biggest achievements after his death. The foundation takes 17 bright youngsters a year and gives them a 12-month hands-on training course to equip them for jobs in the media. What I hope to achieve? Okay, um, I hope to work in news for a while and then go into making documentaries and feature films. Yeah, telling the African story from an African perspective. I want to be an African film director, yeah, uh, to give the Western world a different outlook on Africa because they have, they have a really bad picture about Africa, so they need to see something remarkably different because it is different, yeah, and they don't know what's there. The foundation is working well. Over 90% of our graduates earn a living in the media. Some, like Peter Marimi, have excelled. Peter has already won a CNN African Journalist of the Year award. What is the importance of African journalists telling African stories? As an African, I think it's very important for us to tell our own stories because I was brought up in Africa and the way I see things here and stories here and the way I relate to people and the way I try to perceive is completely different from an outsider. So I think it's very important for stories from Africa to be told by Africans. Africans telling African stories. Yeah. And is, how important is that to you? That is the most important thing to me. In fact, that's what I think I was born to do. Same thing that Mohammed Amin was born to do, to be able to tell the African story. It is important because it gives the Africans a sense of who they are, a sense of belonging, a sense of knowing who they are, where they came from, what, where they are right now, and where they are going. And for me, that's an integral part of my job. What you see in, in my office, and it is my office, it's not his office, it's my office, but what you see in my office is a memory to somebody that I idolized but somebody that achieved more than any other African journalist has achieved in history. And I want to remember that. Whenever I feel that it's too much, that I can't cope with this, that I can't handle a situation, I just have to look around me at what he achieved and I have the strength to continue. And I have his pictures around because I feel he's still watching over me. To a certain extent, I think I've spent the last years since he's died trying to prove to him that I am not the disappointment that he thought I was. I have this recurring nightmare of him not having died in that plane crash and walking into this office and screaming at me and saying, what the f have you done to my office? Where are all my things? Get out of my chair and get out from behind my desk. And what are you doing here? I, I do have, I mean, it's not a nightmare It'd be that, that he's still alive. That's not the nightmare part but it's the repercussions and me sitting there trying to justify what I've done over the last decade to immortalize his memory to a certain degree and to continue his legacy and to continue his company. I think there would be an inner peace that would come at a certain point in my life where I would feel that I have nothing left to prove to him. I think perhaps a string of awards, perhaps some recognition for what I've done or what the students of the foundation have done, which is slowly happening, but there's a long way to go, would 
allow me to sit back and say, Dad, I hope you're happy now.